Welcome to the 2015 Art of Physics show. In the last few months, things got a little dicey in the TV host business, what with Stephen Colbert, Brian Williams, and Jon Stewart all bailing. But I think I'm okay here, right, David? David Sommerfeld, our director, says we can continue. Yeah, I guess Neil deGrasse Tyson is still on, so I suppose we're okay too then. Good. All right. This year we're going to actually have a little variation on our original theme. Um, you know, if you watch Neil deGrasse Tyson on Cosmos, you see that they have a thing called the Ship of Imagination. David, can we show them the Ship of Imagination? There it is. Now see, for the big time kind of programs, they have that kind of stuff. It's a high budget operation, and that's why they can afford that. Um, Ours is a little lower cost, and ours is called Minion Improbable. And that's, as you can see, Minion Improbable says, no job too big, no job too small. I'm Minion Improbable. I can do it all. And Minion Improbable did it all last year, and it was really nice. He had a couple of rocky moments on occasion, uh, but he snagged uh, Professor Einstein. And do we have a picture of that one? Yeah, he got Professor Einstein here. <laughs> Uh, which was really nice for a guest appearance, and he even got a few Einstein quotes and comments as the year progressed. So I was pretty happy with uh, our favorite minion, and I gave him a little wider leash and said to him, if you'd like, can you go a little further and see what else you can do to um, make contact with some famous historical scientists besides Einstein? Well. He did. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little, there's a little caution though, because as it turns out, the group that he made contact with isn't quite as forthcoming as Einstein was, because Einstein came here and did all these great things. Um, this time, however, um, our minion had to actually go to a, some place called the Scientist Protection Program. Um, and so he recruited some people there and that's, we're kind of stuck with some things that have to go on that are a little different because of that. Um, there are some appearance altering devices that we have to put up with. There may be pixelations, there may be all sorts of strange things, voice changing, uh, oh, Lord knows how it's all going to happen. But um, masks, well masks is where we're going to start with here today. Um, Minion Probable tells us that this is the best he's able to do. Now, of course, you've got to realize uh, Minion Improbable's assurances are probably proportional to his salary. And I think you know how much that is. So if you would, please, viewers, um, exercise some patience with the appearances of our guests. Um, I think we should regard this as kind of like a physics experiment. You know, physics experiments sometimes produce wonderful results, and other times, you learn things that you never expected to. So we're just going to have to find out how this works. Uh, so here we go. Uh, the first guests of the season are Aristotle and Democritus. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Glad to be here. Hello. Oh, Hello. That is delightful to have you. My gosh. You know, um, they have masks. You see the masks? Can you see the masks? The mask, because they're real identity, they're masquerading as they're other people, and so we're we're trying to be nice to them so they can maintain their uh, scientists' identity program. It's, I mean, you understand how this works. Okay, great. Um, let's start with Democritus. Democritus, um, you know, uh, welcome to the art of physics. Oh, it's nice to be here, I think. <laughs> uh, you think, huh? Uh, yes, I suppose thinking is pretty much your game, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's what philosophers are supposed to do. Uh, I think you're right. So, uh, you live from 460 to 370 BCE? I have no ideas about those numbers you're spouting, but I was on this earth a long time ago, and I lived about 90 years, give or take a few. It got difficult to keep track toward the end. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> right, uh, you lived in Abdera, which is located in what is now called Greece? Yes, that was where I started. 
Uh, don't you have some sort of map? Oh, maybe there is one. Oh, there it is. There's a map. Can you see Abdera? It's right up near the top of the map. I think you can see it there. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, oh say, you do have nice gadgets here. Oh, thanks. And yes, I started in Abdera, but from there, I ventured far afield. Yes, you know, I understand that you visited Asia, Asia, Ethiopia, and India all extensively <laughs> and spent a long time in Egypt. Aha, uh -huh, indeed. I am the most traveled of all of my contemporaries. I was always on the go. <laughs> I have extended my field of inquiry wider than anyone else. I have seen more countries and climes and heard more speeches of learned men than anyone. It was great while it lasted. <laughs> uh, I think I'm beginning to understand why they call you the laughing philosopher. Well, when you see as much of the human condition as I have, you must either laugh or cry. And I surely wouldn't want to be known as the crying philosopher. Doesn't the world have enough whiners? Oh. Good point. Well, besides all your travels, I understand you have intellectual pursuits also. Oh, yes. I had an excellent teacher, Lucipus. We both sought mechanistic explanations of what happens in the world, and we worried that sense perceptions might be too subjective to be reliable. You know how people are. Huh. How did you finance all this education and travel? Oh, my father was quite wealthy, and he left me a substantial inheritance. I did teach and wrote a bit and as I understand it, my writings really never survived the many wars and governmental challenges that followed my time on Earth. But I do have my fellow philosopher here, thanks to you for helping to keep my memory alive. Oh, 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 oh. Hmm. Uh, uh, okay then. Um, uh, Aristotle. Mm, yeah. Did you mm. live between 384 and 322 BCE? Whatever your numbers mean, I lived for 62 years, most of it in Athens, the cultural center of Greece. Show it on your map, please. Oh, do we have a map of that one, too? Mm. Uh, looks a lot like the same map, but I think Athens is down mm. near the bottom mm -hmm. of the map. Right. Okay. Okay. As you can see, it's far from Demetri's little backwater Abdera. Athens was a busy, lively metropolis. Uh, Aristotle, uh, who was your teacher? I learned a great deal from Plato, who in turn studied uh, under Socrates. Although Plato and I agreed on many things, he insisted on reasoning from general principles to specific instances. Whereas I thought it was much more effective to proceed to general ideas from well-grounded specifics. Uh, excuse me, uh, do you have some kind of a problem? No, I'm just restless. Uh, in my lyceum, the students and I walked as we discussed important issues, and it seemed to keep my head clearer. Oh, yes, uh, you were known as the peripatetic philosophers. That's not the same as pathetic philosophers, is it? Oh! <laughs> uh, gentlemen, please. Aristotle, you were a master of wide-ranging scholarship that laid the groundwork for many academic disciplines. Uh, you l invented and systematized logic, and your observations of marine biology inaugurated that study on such a sound basis that it lasted for centuries. That's quite accurate. I did write more than 200 treaties on intellectual subjects, but alas, only 31 survived, and they're mostly in the form of rough lecture notes. Hmm. If only my successors had been more careful. I understand one work of yours was titled On Democritus. Only fragmentary comments on it are available in the modern era, but it certainly helped me at the time. Very few people in Athens knew me, and your paper at least gave me some name recognition. <laughs> Good thing you were gone by then, so you couldn't read the essay. It wouldn't have pleased you. Was it worse than when you claimed that men have more teeth than females? 
In the case of men, sheep, goats, and swine. <laughs> I'll have you know that some people maintain that I knew everything that could be known at the time I lived. You've got to give me a little slack. I can see we'd better get right to the matter at hand before things get completely out of control. The question here to be discussed today is quite basic. If you begin subdividing matter, would you ever reach a limit? In other words, if you started slicing bologna thinner and thinner, would you ever get to the point where the next cut wouldn't be bologna any longer? Democritus, let's start with you. Oh, it's good you use bologna as an example, because that's what Aristotle has the most of. <laughs> of course, there's a limit. I even gave it a name. It is the a tomas. That's from the Greek a, meaning not, and tomos, meaning to cut. It's been shortened to atoms, and the fact is everything is made of atoms. Here's the way I put it at the time. The first principles of the universe are atoms and empty space. Everything else is merely thought to exist, period. I knew he'd say that. He can laugh all he wants, but his idea is completely wrong. Here's what I wrote about the issue centuries ago. Neither is there a smallest part of what is small, but there is always a smaller, for it is impossible that what is should cease to be. Likewise, there is always something larger than what is large. In other words, it's baloney all the way down. Wait, what? Is that what passes for big-time philosophy in Athens? Oh! <laughs> I should have listened to Plato when he suggested all your books be burned. Ooh. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is Minion Improbable's boss, the Super Minion. His whistle demands order. Super Minion, will you please escort these philosophers out of here, back to wherever they came from? Please. Throwing us out. Ah, well, that was quite a session. Maybe next time Minion and Probable could vet the guests a little better. Now that these old time philosophers have left, we can talk about the modern view of atoms. First of all, both philosophers were wrong, but Aristotle was wronger. Wronger? Okay, um, there is a small building block from which all matter is made and it's called an atom, but it is not uncuttable as Democritus thought. Let's start with the size issue. The unaided human eye is hard pressed to see anything smaller than a human hair, but that's almost a million atoms thick. No wonder Aristotle and Democritus were both mistaken. In fact, even the best optical microscope can't see atoms. Only recently, IBM researchers used a scanning tunneling electron microscope. Scanning, you got that? I'm glad you do. <clears throat> uh, that could show super magnified pictures of individual carbon dioxide molecules. That's one carbon atom and one oxygen atom joined together. Those clever scientists moved the molecules around and made a short animated film.
Now to get down to the nitty gritty. The atom is not actually the smallest thing around. It consists of a nucleus that contains neutrons and protons with electrons moving outside the nucleus. See? Not even Mr. Smarty Pants Dmit Dimitrikos gets it right all the time. Uh, ha ha for uh, him. Ha ha for him. Um, please. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um. <sighs> As I was about to say, the electron appears to have no parts, but the proton and neutron are made of even smaller particles called quarks. Nothing smaller than what is small, eh, Mr. Know-it-all? <laughs> okay, I award each of you a TKO. <laughs> I guess if you can't beat them, you have to join them. So, until next time, I'm Mart Wiggins. <laughs> oh, they're at it.